Mining Moves, the move to gold and money on the move. We'll take up these topics with Dave Kranzler from Investment Research Dynamics. This is Metal Money, and I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Dave Kranzler, welcome to Metal Money. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Patrick. Thanks for having me on again. Thanks for coming on, Dave. Appreciate the time you've, you've given us. So let's jump on right into it. Since we're in the markets, can you give us an idea of how the GDX and the GDXJ have been performing this year relative to the Dow and relative to the S&P? I mean, I haven't run the numbers in the last, I don't know, probably a week or two. But since the bottom in March, I mean, GDX and GDXJ, and th those two are really kind of, they're very highly correlated. And there's not a big difference in the rate of return over a long period of time between the two. Because uh, GDXJ isn't really technically a junior ETF. I mean, it's it's got stocks in there with market caps over a billion dollars. Um, but uh, I I know, let's just say through the end of September, GDX slash GDXJ had outperformed the other ind stock indices, and a lot of the you know on a on a cherry picked basis. A lot of the junior exploration stocks outperformed, you know, these high profile and insanely overvalued tech stocks. Dave, we see the green push coming on and we see things like NIMBY, not in my backyard attitudes and political shifts in Africa at times, certain states in Mexico, and especially in places like Papua New Guinea or PNG, where we see a joint venture between Barrick Gold and Zijin Mining out of China being halted to the best of my knowledge because the mining lease at Orgera was halted or being held up by the prime minister. And he wants this lease to be renegotiated at a time where gold prices are at or around all time highs. So my question is, even in times where miners are making nice profits, how do you navigate or how do investors navigate through the risks of political shifts, jurisdictions and NIMBY attitudes? I, I mean, it's, it's impossible to avoid political risk completely. I mean, and the, the political risk that has affected stocks that I've invested in have, hasn't even been from the, the sovereign level of, of intervention. Um, it, it's come from court decisions at local jurisdictions within, within those countries. So, um, I mean, it's it's just it's just part of the risk of investing in mining stocks, and you know, even my so even myself would say, well, if Barrick's got a huge operation in X Y Z country, I'm sure they've got the political situation under control. Well, the Papua New Guinea situation <laughs> shows that they don't. So, uh, you know, I I think that. I mean, when you're evaluating any stock, not just a mining stock, you got to consider all the potential um, unforeseen risks, you know, beyond just the business, the business and economic risk that's specific to whatever industry or, or economic sector of the economy that that company is operating in. So um, shifting political risk and unforeseen political risk in any country. And that, it can be in the United States even where you can have issues come up uh, that can halt a project or shut down a mine. Um, you know, that's just that's just part of, of the, um, you know, the risk factors involved. And that's part of the reason why mining stocks over time, when they're in a bull market, will have a higher rate of return than, than the general stock market. Okay, so um, that said, uh, yeah. I know I know at least for me. I've, I, after being, you know, bitten in the butt a, a few times from unforeseen local uh, court decisions that have affected projects adversely, uh, I've kind of, right now, I mean, I'll look at anything anywhere in the world, especially if I think the upside outweighs the downside. But most of, most of my uh, investment ideas that I look at now are in North America and, and some in South America. Um, I just think right now, because the sector is so undervalued relative to any other financial asset out there and relative to the amount of fiat currency circulating in the world, that, that there's plenty of undervalued 
projects and, and companies that primarily operate just in Canada, North America, Mexico, and certain South American countries. So okay. I try to confine my investing to those areas. But like I said, I'll, I'll look at, I'll look at a, a, a stock or a company operating anywhere in the world if the upside downside uh, matrix makes sense. Okay, so your favorite location right now is, is North America, South America? Yeah, North America and, and select countries in South America. Okay. Uh, you know, Dave, should the, let's say, should the markets, um, should the markets crash? How will mining stocks fare? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's anyone's guess. I get that question a lot. I mean, the only thing that I can go by is, is what's happened over the 20 year period that I've been involved. And typically what happens is when there's a big sell off, like just say, for instance, what we had in March, the mining stocks and gold and silver will, will, you know, sell off in correlation with the broad stock market. And I've always felt that that was a big part of that was hedge funds unloading positions, just unloading everything that's liquid and has a bid so they can avoid margin calls. Uh, but at some point, you know, the market starts to pull its head out of the sand and, and it starts looking for a flight to safety and yeah. gold and silver start to move up and then the mining stocks follow them and then they'll they'll diverge positively from the rest of the stock market for you know cert, certain period of time i mean you know we saw that in march i mean the the precious metals sector recovered i don't know probably about a week before the general stock markets bottomed out you know um and i think it would have been longer than that if the fed didn't step in with an unprecedented amount of of uh, monetary inter intervention in the markets. I mean, we saw that in 2008, the, the precious metal sector bottomed out at the end of October yeah. in 2008, and it started moving higher. The S&P bounced briefly and then started heading south again into, I think it bottomed, didn't bottom out until mid-March 2009. And meanwhile, the whole time, the precious metal sector was moving higher. Uh, in fact, like, for instance, the, the Huey index, that that was at at the end of October or early November. That was at, that bottomed out around 150, and by the end of 2008, it had doubled. So, um, I mean, again, like I said, it's anyone's guess as to what will happen. But you know, I'm just uh, using that as my model. I think that's what we'll see once again um, when the stock market eventually rediscovers price discovery and, and has a has a big drop. So, Dave, we we talked a bit about miners. And we're touching a bit on gold and silver right now. <clears throat> How do you see the price action for gold and silver moving? And are you expecting silver anytime soon to hit all-time highs the way gold already has? I mean, I hate to I hate to put time frames on this. Sure. You know, again, I, I, I just going by historical relationships. At some point, I have to believe silver is going to get a massive a massive amount of buy interest that's going to push it up to an all-time high and and um at least at least kind of undergo a regression to the mean of the gold silver ratio so mm -hmm. in 2011 the gold silver ratio got as low as i don't know like 30 or something like that 30 plus or minus and right now as of friday it was at 78 so uh to me that suggests silver has the potential to move up twice as fast as gold once once you know i'm not sure that the sell-off that that started in early august in the sector is, is completely run its course yet but you know once once the uptrend resumes i think we'll see silver move up a lot more quickly than gold again okay and so the upcoming elections do you think they're going to have um, an effect on gold and silver prices safe haven assets well that's a good question too i mean <laughs> Who knows? You know, like when when uh, in 2016, when it was apparent that Trump was going to win the election, gold, you know, took off like a bat out of hell. And then sometime early, early the next morning, um, it, you know, it did a, a upside down U-turn and went straight back down. And I, to me, I attribute that to the massive amount of manipulation that goes on. In the, especially in the in the paper derivative markets, but 
Um, yeah, I think I think that's part of why you're starting to see a lot of uh, very big, smart money, you know, well-respected names start to pile into uh, the precious metal sector. I think that's part of it is political uncertainty and instability. And and yeah, at some point, and again, I don't want to put a time frame on it, but the precious metal sector is going to see a, a big flow of funds into flight to safety. Last question. What's your take on the, the LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, and the, the so far the secured overnight financing rate? Uh, the news that's come out where $80 trillion of notional debt will be refinanced or revalued. You know, when that news first hit that they were going to, you know, switch from LIBOR to SOFR, I kind of read through the article and, I mean, I, I, I kind of dismissed it because, it, to me, it looks like it's it's devised to give the Fed more control over the overnight inter or not, you know, overnight or short term interbank rate, interbank lending rate. So um, to me, I think it's, you know, they're, they're using the excuse that LIBOR was easily manipulated. Um, to me, I again, I got to look I would have to look a little more deeply into it because I'm not sure how they're going to set the SOFR. Sounds like it's it's really in in the Federal Reserve's purview to set the rate. And I, again, I I don't know because I had, didn't read the fine print on how SOFR is going to be implemented. Um, but in my opinion, the whole thing is designed to give the Fed another tool that'll help it control the yield curve and control interest rates. So, I mean, that's the way I look at it. And in terms of revaluing, you know whatever amount of debt. I mean, I, I guess that probably depends to a degree on where the SOFR rate is initially set versus where LIBOR is right now. Okay, Dave Krasler from Investment Research Dynamics. We appreciate the time you've given us and hope we can do this again soon. Thanks for having me on again, Patrick. It's always a pleasure. Mining stocks on the move, money on the move. Where is some of that money moving to? It's moving to gold. Keep it liquid, keep it real, and as always, let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'll see you on the next edition of Metal Money.